this is Mike Green. Uh, I'm one of your comedians for tonight. I am looking for directions and a show time for this evening. If you could give me a call back. Okay. See you, man. Have fun. Bye, Dave. Be funny. Yeah, whatever. There's, there's times when I go... I, I don't know what I'm hoping to accomplish anymore, you know? And there's a lot to the business end, like I always thought. All you had to do was be funny. People don't want to come out to a comedy club and hear about politics, and they don't want to think, and they don't want you to change their way of thinking. I think of it as a vacation. You come out, you uh, have fun, you laugh, and then you have to go back to your life. We need comedy for those days when instead of hitting snooze, you turn the alarm off, making you late for work. And in your rush to get to work, you spill molten hot $4 a cup Starbucks latte all over a private part of your body. A private part, pal, I know that you named. <laughs> It feels like the end of the world, and I just need a good laugh! <laughs> That's why you're here tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Your headliner this evening, let's hear it for Dave Bouillet. Getting a paying gig at the Comedy Castle in Royal Oak was a big deal for me. You say, for example, you start at 12, but now it's 2.30, and you're bought, coincidentally, the same time that an Asian man goes to the dentist. <laughs> 2.30. Anyway, so, uh, but yeah, for telling like that's not funny, you fuckers. That's funny. 2.30. All right, so. If you're not making people laugh in the comedy club while you're up talking, then you're a poet. Some people I call comics. They really haven't developed it yet. They're not professionals, in my opinion. Then other people that are comedians, if it's their job, their career, they're great at it. If a fat person goes swimming naked, is that still skinny dipping? <laughs> Do pimps eat at McDonald's? <laughs> Give me some fries, baby. You have to be tough. I mean, it's just like you're standing up, it's like you're going on a blind date with like 200 people. When two people meet, they have that initial spark, that magic. It's called love at first sight. Yeah. Uh, when only one person has it, apparently that's called stalking. <laughs> and I know that now. I don't think there is any um, one personality trait or personality type that makes a comedian. I have as much fun up there as I think the audience does, and they can detect that. I'm suffering now for arthritis, and I went to the doctor's office, and I was bent over like this, had a cane, I went in there, I was in five minutes, I came back out and straight as hell. I walked back into the doctor and I said, what the hell did you do? He said, I gave you a longer cane. <laughs> you guys like impressions? Yeah. I don't do any, I just wonder if you like them. He used to do a hell of an impression of Jello. Eat me! <laughs> I can't describe it. It's sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, man. It's beautiful. If anything, you walk out feeling great about, you know, what happened for the last hour and a half. You forgot about your problems. The smallest crowd I ever performed in front of, I was in Sarnia, Canada, and I had maybe 15 minutes worth of material. It was really early on. It was downstairs from a strip bar. When I got on stage, some guy ran down from the strip bar and said, bunny or Taffy Melons or whatever her name was, is having a seizure and she's naked and everybody in the room, the old woman, the people in the audience, the bartender, the other comedians, they all went upstairs and I was literally standing on stage with no one in the room and a microphone in my hand and I told her I, I could follow jugglers and magicians and all that stuff but I can't follow a stripper having a seizure. voted class clown in my high school, so that gives you an idea how much I love comedy. My parents would give me record albums every year for my birthday. For Christmas, I would get Bob Newhart, Bill Cosby, Don Rickles. I mean, these were, you know, I loved listening to comedy albums. That's what I grew up on. So I went to Los Angeles. I started going to the comedy store and the improv that were out there, and I just thought that was phenomenal. Here, I'm, I'm looking at Richard Pryor on stage. I'm looking at uh, a young David Letterman who just moved out there. Uh, good morning, Christopher Titus's room, please. Uh, I don't know. I'm picking him up here. Uh, we're doing radio interviews this morning. 
Christopher. Oh, morning, man. <laughs> I don't like getting them at 6 a.m. to do radio. <laughs> Good to see you. And I got into show business, so I didn't have to get up this early. What am I doing here? <laughs> Everything all go okay in the pickup last night? Uh, no. The guy, the guy from Metro Cab, was just like, he just kept going. What's your confirmation number? I'm going. Well, look, just take me to the hotel. What's your confirmation number? I go. What does it matter? Just get us to the hotel. And he goes. Well, I want to know how I'm getting paid. I went, what? And I'm thinking. What do I look like? A homeless guy? I'll pay you. You know what I mean? No, they are. All, you didn't pay him anything, did you? No, in fact, yeah, oh. I made him call. I made him call the okay, thing, and good. He, he found it. I so. said, "Don't you know who I am?" And he said, well, "I used to when you had a television show." Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm working on a new one. Yeah. Pull over. Let me out here. I'm walking. Yeah. Didn't you used to be somebody? Uh, <laughs> no, I was on Fox. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> I came back here, but always with that little nugget in the back of my mind about a, a comedy nightclub. So finally, I just. Uh, started making some inquiries and went back to a couple of restaurants that I used to work at and said, I've got an idea. And I knew that they had empty space. And I said, the idea is a nightclub for comedians that I picked up in Los Angeles. And it was like one big open mic night. We did that for about a month and a half until I started bringing headliners in. Mark broke some of the biggest acts in the, in the, in the country. Tim Allen, huh? Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing. <coughs> He's one of my friends. He started me in this business, and I do owe him a lot, but he's never going to get any of that shit back. <laughs> and here's to another 10 years, and leave me a forwarding address to Mark Ridley. Thank you, sir. But that's right around the t same time that Tim Allen started doing stand-up comedy. Dave Coulier started doing stand-up comedy. I still remember the, the night when you were downstairs at, was it the meeting the place? Meeting place, yeah, yeah. The little L-shaped room? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I had a great set. And I remember afterwards you just saying, hey, stick around, I want to talk to you. And I was like, oh man, what did I say? <laughs> what did I do wrong? So the early 80s, as good as they were from a comedy standpoint, behind the scenes, the business end, you know, there was a lot of hopping around from place to place to place. I've faced near bankruptcy twice, you know, where I almost declared bankruptcy. Uh, I've been in a uh, knockdown, drag out, not only fist fight, but legal battle with one of the restaurant owners. For about nine months, I wasn't even drawing pay from the Comedy Castle. I was working a day job while trying to keep this going at night. All right, so we got one call in and three other ones, three stop Yeah, we got one call in. We're doing the classic rock show. We're doing Purton and the Oldies, and then we're going downtown. Okay. Do today's hits. So we're covering all the, all the bases on demographics. You know, I've always looked at stand-up comedy as an art form. There are club owners that don't treat it as an art form, and that's too bad because they're kind of missing the whole point of it. And Mark came up to me one day after he, I headlined, and it was the first club I ever headlined for a whole week. And uh, he pulled me aside after the show, and he said, God, you know, you're, you're really getting good, and I think you're ready to move to L.A. That's another thing about Mark. Mark will actually watch the show. I mean, Mark's doing this big thing. Mark will actually yeah. watch the comedy show and give you notes. I do. I like watching it. Yeah, but some do. club owners are just like, you did five minutes too long, or you did five minutes too short. And... Really? I'm just a frustrated comedian who happens to be a club, club exactly. owner. Exactly. <laughs> I used to MC the shows. I did it for, let's see, when did I quit? <laughs> I quit about 10 years ago. My mother played piano for many years here in Detroit and I knew what she made, and I knew what she had to put up with when she worked. So the one thing that I wanted to make sure of when a comedian came to town is that they were comfortable. If they were comfortable and they knew that they could, that I would hand them that check and they went back to Los Angeles or to New York or wherever and were able to put that check in the bank and it cleared, that they would come back again and they would spread the word. So right now there are a lot of people that aren't in business anymore <laughs> because their check wouldn't clear and they were assholes to the, uh, to the artist. Me and a few guys, I can't even believe how long you've made it, man. Make it through all the hard times, clubs close all the time. You yeah. just always keep chugging. Mark in here? Yep. 8 and 10.30, right? 8 and 10.30, yeah. See, I had to clean What's that phone number there? Uh, I don't know. What is the phone number there, Mark? 248-542-9900. That would be the... 248-542-9900. Good, uh, good oh, whoring in the club. I like that. I'm one of the best. Yeah, you are. <laughs> 24 years of whoring, my yeah, friend. Right. The club's still going. Yeah. How would you run numbers? You're still doing better than what we did with Jenny. Really? Yes. No way. 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 All right, man. Wow. <laughs> Mark, Mark got me with the way. He totally stumped me. I'm like, wow. I was the funny guy in school. Like everybody always says, like all comedians say. And um, I have like yearbook signatures that say, you should be a comedian. And I had teachers tell me, you know, 
What are you gonna be a comedian? I started to think how descriptive all the sirens are. Like ambulances sound like the person in them. Because ambulances, they go, ow, ow, because <laughs> it hurts, you know, to be in an ambulance. It would suck to get pulled over in London, in England, because they don't just pull you over, they make fun of you too. In London, they're like, nah, 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 nah. The best siren of all is fire trucks. Fire trucks are cool. They go, they're like, houses. <laughs> and so when I got out of high school, you know, I had no direction in my life, and I thought, well, maybe I'll be a comedian. So that's what I did. I started uh, going to open mic nights, and, uh, and it was probably the first time in my life I found something that I was good at. Open mic nights, yeah, you gonna start doing comedy? Uh, with open mic night, you gotta, you gotta phone in like a week in advance. You have to call like on Thursday and get your name on the list, and then you have to call back Tuesday to find out if you were on the list. You know, weeks will go by. No, sorry, you didn't make the cut. No, sorry, you didn't make the cut. I'm just making up the uh, comedian schedule for next week. Got 13 comedians on open mic, and then I fill out the schedule of the people that are already scheduled that are scheduled last year. Well, finally, you call. You say, you know, I was on the list. Uh, did I make the cut? They say, yes, you're on this week. That's when the butterflies start. It's like, oh, oh, no, I made it. I hate open mic night. I hate it with a passion because it reminds me of how bad I was at times <laughs> when I first started. When I was a kid, you know, there were, we didn't have comedy clubs around at that time. You had to be good in order to get booked. You had to have a reputation in order to get booked. We had no places to try out stuff. Walking out on stage and trying out something for the very first time is probably as bad as asking the most beautiful woman you knew in high school for a date. <laughs> so, you know, you're going to be scared to death. I was scared. I was flat out scared. Up until probably a day or two before the performance, the, the butterflies really start to churn and you start, you start obsessing about it. And then the day of is, is really pretty brutal. That, that whole feeling of, of nervousness and queasiness peaks when you're in the green room backstage. You hear the comedian before you go, thanks, good night, it's been great. The MC comes out and says, you know, give it up for so-and-so, and you know you're next. That's when it peaks. That's when you feel like you want to vomit. And you think, I don't want to go out there. I don't want to go out there. And if everything goes well, you walk off that stage, and it's that moment that makes you want to do it again. It's that moment that was like, oh, that was so great. That was so satisfying. And the first joke I told, the joke was, um, I was talking to my grandma earlier today. And she told me that I was funny, and she said, you should be a comedian. And I go, well, I'm gonna, Grandma. Tonight's the night. You know, I'm gonna do an open mic night, and I'm gonna become a comedian. And she said, well, you're not gonna be like a dirty comedian or somebody who insults everybody like Don Rickles or Buddy Hackett, are you? And I go, uh, you bet your wrinkly tits, bitch. That was the joke. And, um, <laughs> and it got a huge laugh, but for all the wrong reasons, and it took me a while to figure that out. And I remember at one point, there was a, a comedian named Geechee Guy. He came into an open mic night once, and he asked if he could have a spot. And I remember he wasn't on the list, but then Mark just put him on the list because he was funny enough. And I remember thinking, man, if I could ever do that, just walk into the comedy castle and get my name on the list, that'd be great. And then subsequently, a few years later, I got to. I never set out to be a comedian. I recently taped an HBO special on my uh, VCR at home. <laughs> I kind of fell into it. I started doing the open mics regularly, and then I started getting established comedians who would ask me to come open for them. Uh, they'd pay me gas money, and I thought, wow, this is a, a, becoming more than a hobby. Ms. Burns. Mr. Green, good, good set. set. And then eventually I thought of it as a part-time job because I started making money doing it locally. And then uh, I started taking a couple of road trips with comics and after I did that I was useless at work. And that's when I set out to make it my career. And I'm very lucky to be able to make my living doing something I love to do. So these are all my keys when I've stayed in a hotel for the last six months. I don't know what I'm going to do with them yet. They're impressed that I stay in hotels all the time. Oh, I that. My brother said I'd that. I'd love to show them the hotels. My brother's like, you get to stay in hotels every night. I'm like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. 
when before the television show, I did a lot of stuff on the road, and people would would think that that's very, very adventurous and romantic. And I said, you know, after a while, when you've seen everything, it's it's no longer exciting. You know, living out of a suitcase is no good. At the cheap motels, the bellman is the concierge and the valet and the housekeeper, and give you a hook up on pizza late at night and all that. So I come out of the hotel tonight. I looked hot for a fat chick, I did. I had on the red dress, the red shoes. There were kids playing video games, came running up to me going, Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid. <laughs> Little bastards. So I ate them. <laughs> I'm headed off to Battle Creek, Michigan, Gary Fields Comedy Club. I work uh, 50 weeks out of the year. I'm on the road. Mostly I sit here and, you know, I'll redecorate my mom's house. I'll, uh, I'll write my Oscar speech. That's the one I, I work on. I do an interview with Barbara Walters, what I would say to her, people I'd mention, people I won't mention. And if I'm really tired and really bored, I'll flash the truckers. <laughs> Oh, he's looking. He's looking. Hey, baby. <laughs> this will be me. Here we go. Oh, Julius. Oh, Julius. This will be you. Grizzly. Grizzly. Get off me. I am not society's opinion of beautiful. But when I come off stage, I started getting hit on, and it just surprised me, it shocked me. But it was kind of cool too, and I actually became kind of like a little slut about it. If I get you drunk, we're getting naked and taking dirty pictures, all right? We'll do that, okay? I, yeah, I, I got a camera. <laughs> um, I figured why should the guys have all the fun? So I, I started having a lot of fun on the road. We're drunk, we're listening to CDs, we're taking dirty pictures. You gotta live out my fantasy. It won't hurt. Look what I brought for you to wear, baby. Oh my God, it's the Krispy Kreme hat. We gotta put this on. Part of it also is an insecurity about the way I look and about wanting people to like me so much that sometimes if I can get them to laugh, I know they'll all like me. Nobody's more happier or, or well-adjusted than a stand-up comedian. I'm sure that's pretty obvious. You can uh, just endure the pain and, and do nothing or you can try to take that pain and flip it on its on its side and and try to laugh at it i mean maybe it's some sort of uh you know repairing yourself and so you get up there and you get approval for what you do humor is just you know, another coping mechanism where's the girlfriend oh, maybe we can kick her out and lock the door that's fine with me. I can take you back to the green room. Do what I gotta do. <laughs> what it came down to is it's made me like myself. It has increased my self-esteem so much. I'm so much more secure. I, I like myself. And, and that was a, that's a bigger mountain to climb than anybody I think realizes. One day I saw an article in a local newspaper saying that a local bar had started a, a amateur stand-up comedy night. I went up and I watched it one night. I saw the guys that were doing it and I said, I can do that. And the next week I was back doing it and I've been doing it for 24 years ever since. Please put your hands together for a very funny man and a good friend of mine, Mr. Tim Lilly, everybody. Tim! The comedy circuit was really, at that time, just being built and they were in search of people to go out and do the jobs and everything like that. My first road gig, the person called me out of the clear blue sky. He called me on a Wednesday. He goes, you want to come to Columbus, Ohio on Friday and Saturday? And I went, no, I don't think so. And he goes, no, I don't think you understand what I'm offering you. So I took the job and that's really how I got in to the, get into the circuit. I'm having a shitty week, I'll tell you that right now. Started yesterday morning, first thing out the door, I stepped in dog shit. I didn't just step in dog shit either, I turd surfed. <laughs> there are certainly sacrifices that have to be made to be a stand-up comic. My comedy career has cost me two marriages. My first marriage, probably because I was on the road so much. Uh, I'm divorced. 
<laughs> I know you're thinking, the fool. <laughs> Why, who could leave that big fat burr lives looking son of a bitch, huh? <laughs> if as they're coming up, if they're married, you know, what do they do? They have to leave on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. They're gone for three or four days, come home, you know, say hi to the wife, the family, clean up, go back on the road again. It genuinely takes a day to get readjusted to being off the road and back in your little family. And then when you're on the road, some people see it as you shirking your responsibilities at home. And like, um, I suppose, all three of my ex-wives. Was it Ken Rogerson says, why is divorce so expensive? Because it's worth it. <laughs> okay, just so I know who I'm talking to, real quick, clap if you've ever been through a divorce. Clap if you've ever been through a divorce. <laughs> it's definitely enough to talk about. I always kind of laugh though because you see the ladies and the ladies always clapping like, <laughs> and the guys are clapping like, yeah, I've been through a fucking divorce. I ran into Tim Allen. Tim goes, uh, you know, how how you doing? I go, no, not too good. I'm going through, getting ready to go through a divorce, and he goes, oh man, that's it. He goes, you you got to come out to L.A. I'll help you. I'll give you phone numbers. I'll I'll get you to meet people and all that kind of stuff. So. The next day I called him, I said, Tim, were, were you serious about that? And he goes, uh, oh yeah, yeah, uh, call me next week in L.A. And, uh, and we'll work something out. And So I called him the next week in L.A. and he had changed his phone number. It chose me. I did not pick comedy. Uh, it's just always been there. And like I said, my dad was always funny. I've always been funny to me. And I always loved funny. How lazy can you be in the drive through that you can't speak to me? And what messed me up is the girl on the recording was sounding good. <laughs> you talking about six months? She was all sexy and smooth. Hi. Welcome to KFC. Would you like to try a new eight piece meal? Original recipe, which includes biscuits, gravy, <laughs> coleslaw, and mashed potatoes. <laughs> Only $11.99. Uh, no thank you. All right, then, go ahead with your order. <laughs> That's some chicken you can keep. That's the devil. Okay, so I got like 10 minutes as I gauge it. So you know what my problem is? I'll say I have 10 minutes, but I really don't have 10 minutes. That's my problem. I don't add in that leaving time. I found out about an audition for Star Search in Chicago. So me and the comedian Frank G and a friend of ours drove down to Chicago, stood in line outside in the cold, got in, did the audition. It didn't, I went up first. It was horrible. It was just a group of comics in a room. I told some comedians I know from Detroit about it. They auditioned and got picked for it. So I'm like, how they got on before me? And I'm the one told them. But anyway, just prayed about it. It was like, well, you know what? Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. But I felt like I had a good showcase. I did a showcase pretty recently. And, I, you know, the development deal is more what I'm interested in than the money that they give away on the show. I have an idea that I'm pretty hot on, and I'd like to be able to pitch a sitcom. I, I mean, I would be thrilled to, to have a sitcom. I mean, I, I think having my own show would be great. I'd love to have my own show. I've had a couple guys who've opened for me now who are, who are getting TV shows. You know, it's all about getting a development deal. And it's pretty much to hold you so they can develop a show for you, whether it works or not. Most often the deals don't turn successful, but it's a precaution, it's a gamble that, that networks take. The comedians that you see that have their own sitcoms now, like Tim Allen or had his own sitcom, George Lopez, Drew Carey, it's all based on 10 minutes of their act. It's like that solid 10 minutes that just says, oh my gosh, we could build a show around this. And they have, you know, they've, if you see the credits, based on the, the stand-up of George Lopez or Ray Romano. And believe it or not, there are people that have done it out of Detroit. They could, they, he could develop something here, and once somebody sees that, you know, it could be the, the next Tim Allen did out of Detroit. So then I did this big show with Sinbad in Los Angeles in November. But what I didn't realize is the vice presidents from CBS and NBC were at Sinbad's concert. So they decided to bring me out here. I had a couple meetings with the staff at CBS. Then I got the call, I was gonna do Star Search. So I went back home and they uh, sent my tickets and my itinerary. It was like, come on out. We're gonna put you on the, on the new season. We're doing a new season. Our senior hall is hosting. He is HB to us around here. You know him as Horace Sanders. 
I watched a study on 60 Minutes. It said the average man uses 3,000 words a day. I know, fellas, that sounds like a lot of words. But it went on to say that the average woman uses 7,000 words a day. See, it don't sound like that much no more. It ain't that we don't want to talk to y'all. By the time we come home from work, we didn't use most of our words for today. We got like 28 words left. We want to talk to the kids, check on our mama, see how our friends doing. Here you go, hogging everything. Where you been? How was your day? What's wrong with you? What you got attitude now? You can't talk to me? Ooh! Wait till I get a day off. Thank you. Yeah. HP. Let's keep it going. Same energy. Show some love for Mr. Johnny Ginger. Well, I started this long career, uh, thanks to my mom and dad and my brother, when I was six years old. They threw me on stage at the Paramount Theater in Toledo, Ohio. So they threw me on, we did this Sonny Boy routine, and it kind of picked the audience up, and the act went over real well. <laughs> I told my mother and dad at the time, I said, I want to be a comedian. And they all laughed at me. And I worked all of the years, and I became a comic, and now nobody's laughing anymore. <laughs> I was in uh, Canada, in Windsor, and uh, they were scouting for a host for a summer replacement show at WXYZ, and they were hitting all the clubs and looking at the comics, and they liked what I was doing as far as physical things. So I thought, whoa, I got myself a television show, and I called everybody I knew. I said, I'm going to be on TV. Introducing from Madagascar, weighing 73 pounds, the challenger, Johnny Ginger. How many people remember the Johnny Ginger show? <laughs> Having a television show coming out of nightclubs was a big feather in your cap. All of a sudden the money went up in nightclubs because I had a television show and the money just kept pouring in and I thought, well, this is great. Soupy and I were both written up in Look Magazine as the highest paid local kitty entertainers in the country. I love the comedy club business, but you know, let's face it, I work nights and, you know, at some point in my life I'd like to have a life, you know, with my wife and, and enjoy the fruits of our labor. The club will never just take care of itself, but I've got great people that work here and, you know, I, I trust them quite a bit and they've been here a long time. You know, some, some of the people have worked up to 17 years for me. You like managing work? Yeah, yeah, I really do. It's, uh, you know what it is? After 24 years of doing this, it's something a little bit different, you know. It's yeah. To me, the process of opening a club, there's nothing like it. The process of working with a comedian and seeing them evolve into a, you know, a nationally known act would be as satisfying as fulfilling to me too. Basically, it's advising them on choices, making connections. Well, let's face it, I've got 24 years of connections. The manager's goal is to do all that talking that you don't want to do. To early on, when you don't have an agent, they manage bookings and shows. People think, you know, agents are, they don't have a heart. I said, actually, they do. I said, but you can take an agent's heart and stuff it in the ass of a flea and have room for three BBs. The agent just books stuff for you. They get a percentage of what they work to get you booked on. So if they don't book you on nothing, they don't get no money. Isn't it great to build them up, spend all the time with them, make them famous, and, you know, get and them And then get, they leave. And then they leave. <laughs> then they sign with Gerstein Gray in L.A. Good for you, Mark. I took you to dinner And I got you liquored up I told you you were awesome But you still wouldn't give it up I bought you popcorn at the movies So when am I gonna see your boobies? When I first met Chris Newberg, he had an idea which I thought was very, very good. I sought him initially, you know, and he wasn't really managing. I mean, he was kind of co-managing a couple of people, but I was pretty persistent as well. And I kept saying, come on, we can do this, we can do this. And eventually, I guess I convinced him. So I gave him the standard contract that they have and, uh, you know, management contract that they have in Los Angeles. I mean, I'm very pleased with him and as a manager. I mean, he's a good guy. Yeah, all right, that was a little weird. That didn't go over too well. That was a little bit creepy. In fact, that went over about as well as the time when I met Max's girlfriend's father for the first time. He's like, what do you do for fun? I was like, your daughter. <laughs> I mean, I guess I knew I was funny a long time ago. 
high school, grade school. I mean, I didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm funny. J. Chris Newberg, he has a big advantage because he was in music before comedy. So he was used to being on stage and he was just great right away. I, was, I started a band when I was 18 years old and uh, you know, I wanted to be a big rock star. You know, tour the world, live the dream, do the whole thing. And um, I said, I gave myself a, a limitation. I said, if I get to be 30 and I'm up north playing cover songs or if I'm in a wedding band, I'm done, you know. I got to be 30 and we were in Traverse City, Michigan and I looked down at the set list and there was a bunch of covers on it. So I gave my two weeks notice and I thought I was just going to go back working full time, but I wanted to get, you know, I wanted to stay into the like performance aspect of it. Okay, you've been driving in your car, just jamming, just rocking out, just really, really getting into the tune and all of a sudden realize that you're fooled because you've been listening to a commercial. <laughs> you know, it's like, I've been thinking about you and me. So let's go down the subway, yeah! Get ourselves a sandwich! Girl, you remind me of a sandwich. I tried stand up right away, and I always want to play, I always want to learn, I always want to get better, and when I fail, I want to figure out why I failed and how to fix it. And He just started working right away, and he's worked his way up incredibly fast. That's awesome. They're making it at the comedy show. <laughs> We're up here telling jokes, and they're on third base. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Oh, he picks up his drink and smells his hand. <laughs> smooth! Very fucking smooth, brother. But really funny, at the end of uh, where he signs, he has his name and he says, representing, it's under quantum talent, representing only the best in entertainment, including Mike Raber and the world's funniest guitar virtuoso, comedian Mike Green and hypnotist Michael Anthony. For all your Mike needs. <laughs> yeah. My name's Mike Green, and the only reason I say that again is because I always think like, what's going to happen is um, you'll be at work when you get back on Tuesday, and people are going to say, "What'd you do the, over Labor Day?" And you're going to go, "Well, we went to Chaplin's," and you're going to go, "Who'd you see?" <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Some guy who looked like Brian Adams fucked Michael J. Fox or something. <laughs> I tend to try and align myself with people that I know are very, very talented. Number one very aggressive and hardworking. And in Mike's case, I, I see a lot of potential. I see a, a guy who really should be a lot bigger than he is right now. What I do is I get books on tape when I travel. And, and real recently, I was in Dayton, Ohio, and the book that I wanted on tape was 38 bucks. And I thought, I'm not going to spend 38 bucks to have somebody read me a book because that's dumb. And then um, the same book in paperback was $4. So I thought, man, I'm just being lazy. So I buy the paperback, and then I'm driving downtown Dayton, and I see one of those guys holding the sign that said, we'll work for food, right? So I start thinking, I'll buy him a couple Big Macs, put him in the back seat, have him read me the book, right? But, uh, that sounds good in theory. Six hours later, he's still on Choo Choo Chapter 2. <laughs> Turns out homeless people are not good readers. <laughs> I think he was making some stuff up, too, because there wasn't a blowjob in Hamlet. Was there? there was not. I sit in the back of the room and I watch a crowd when he's on stage just pounding the table or doing this to the person sitting next to them. So he's hitting all the right nerves. And when you see that happen, you know somebody has it. I remember a newspaper article here in Detroit where it asked a club owner who was going to be the next uh, big act out of Detroit, and he said it was me. You know, that's all, always very flattering, but uh, nothing like that's ever happened. So I don't know. I have open micers. I have, like, new guys coming up to me now, and they go, uh, so how come you're not famous yet? <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, I don't know. I really, I genuinely don't know. Mike's not a businessman. He's a, you know, we call it show business. There are people that are show people and there are people that are business people. Mike's not a business person. I know people who are half as funny as me, who make twice the money. The luck has a, is a big factor. I was always in the right place at the right time. And that, that, is, that means a lot. I mean, there are so many talented people out there that are doing squat. Is he fucked up, you think? Or does he think he's something's up? I'm fortunate enough to like be able to like have my own business so I don't have to play every weekend for you know my livelihood. Sort of like a three-tiered business where we do court filings. We also do service of process as far as subpoenas and summons and complaints. And we also do private investigative work where we follow people. In the 920 hour, suspect drove through Republic Bank, through another building, circled twice, here to one on the wrong street. I'm like a grown-up eighth-grade tattletale, you know, tattler. I'm like Susie saw Jimmy, 
in the third hour holding hands and now it's pretty much like the same thing except third hour is now a strip bar you know and when one guy hooks up with some girl it ends up being like the half of his asset lap dance I like most people who you know are pursuing their dreams I want to get to the point where I don't have to do my day job anymore and I can just do comedy I don't make anywhere near enough to live off of it there's a little picture of me in Los Angeles on the street with unkempt hair. It's madness. J. Chris Mania, they're calling it. Uh, in studio with us, he's got a, a new CD that is out. It is his latest CD, and, and his uh, CD um, party is t uh, tomorrow night. Magic Bag in Ferndale is J. Chris Newberg and got a great write up in the uh, this morning's newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is my Father's Day song for your baby's daddy. Whoever. <laughs> <laughs> you taught me how to fish. Then you showed me how to burp. <laughs> you gave me my first schlitz when I was a twerp. And I just want to say thank you to you on your special day. Thank you for teaching me guy stuff in your own special way. Happy Father's Day, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Father's Day, Grandma. Yeah. Touches the heart. I see you out when he gonna be big in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mark Mike Green, just wanted to touch base with you. Um, I am going to send you my avails for the next quarter because I don't uh, believe you have them. It's like anybody else, he has to worry about making his bills, where's next week going to come from, next, you know, next paycheck. A lot of guys in this business, if they're doing stand-up, they're kind of, you know, they're on the phone hustling all the time trying to find out where the next check is going to come from. You can look at their schedule, they got one week in June, one week in July. I hit the books, you know, I try to call people and try to make sure that everybody who's working with me, like uh, Mark or uh, my college agent, uh, make sure that they're all doing what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, I call agencies and I call uh, clubs individually. And if, if you miss a window as small as a day or two, you could be, have a trouble uh, getting bookings over the next three months. The agency I call today is kind of my last ditch, like when I can't when I can't fill my book with uh, A rooms, I call them and I try to take one nighters and and, uh, and stuff like that. Hey, I am looking to see if you have anything this summer. Do you have Carbondale in St. Louis again? Or? I'm actually I haven't been to Rochester in a while. I was looking to get that. I know they love me there. They probably have me back. Is Toledo booked? It's Rockford, Illinois, though. Oh, that's not. Thanks. First thing he did was a. Uh, cancel 700 bucks worth of work when you get on the phones and there's nothing happening out there that can just be devastating and there's there's no no glory to that you want me in january all right is he going to change the money okay i'll do that it's beloit and wasa october 7th is lacrosse 200 for carbondale and 500 for the friday saturday how's that breakdown it's two two 226. Dubuque is the 8th. I'll do that. If it's January, tell him I went like 15. And if you're only making 700 to $1,000 or $1,200 for that week, that's your monthly nut. So you kind of have to, you, you have those things you worry about too if you're not working a day job, you know. I tried to maintain a regular job and do stand up, and that was completely impossible. You know, I'd be out till 2.30 at night and then I'd have to be at work at 7 in the morning and it was just impossible. My favorite guy is um, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith because he makes shit up. Like in the song, Dude Looks Like a Lady, for no reason at all, at the end of that song, he goes, Yeah! -ca 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 <laughs> that's his job. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good job. If you could do that at work, that's a good job. I can't imagine where else I could go after 17 years of this. You can't put this on a resume to work a corporate job. They'd say, what kind of experience do you have? Well, I'm really funny. So I'm kind of locked into it. I feel, I feel kind of trapped in it. But, you know, I can't imagine working a day job. I gamble so I could talk about what I would do if I did win. 
I'm never going to win, but it's fun to, like, I would go look for a job. If I won that kind of money, I'd put out a whole shitload of applications. <laughs> for every suck-ass job interview you've ever been on in your life, now you could go on one with no pressure. <laughs> like if you, have, you have $20 million and you have some real anal guy interviewing you, he's a human resource guy going, uh, so, Mr. Green, what could you do for our company? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I would sit there in my underwear smoking a cigarette. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, I've been here two minutes and I'm already sick of your ass, I quit. <laughs> yeah, go, go, go. There was a guy who was booking The Tonight Show and he, he fell in love with me. He said I was, you know, gonna do The Tonight Show. Those were his words and, and you know, it all uh, fell apart. I think he, he uh, lost his job or something. Part of my job as a manager, and, and I think a lot of guys do this, I'm not going to sit and stroke somebody or blow smoke and tell them, you know, that everything's going to be okay. You know, when you get close, you think you're going to be the next guy, and then, you know, here I am back doing one-nighters again, so. If you don't make it after so long, sometimes some people just allow that rejection to turn into bitterness. And I understand it. I've seen it. I've, I've been on that precipice where you're like, what am I going to decide? Am I going to let this go? You know, what they did to me or what this other comedian or they didn't give me this show? Um, or am I just going to keep it and hold it? We came up with an expression, onward and upward. So, we, you know, we kind of have to look forward to, yeah, that was a setback, but what's the next thing in line? So, you know, you're going to have setbacks. If you don't, it's not, you know, you're not going to grow. If, if you're funny enough and you make enough noise, I think, eventually they have to uh, look at you. They have to. And here we are. Home sweet home for the next week. Yeah, I know the show started at 8. I talked to Gary today. He had it wrong, too. Did he, did he tell you what he was calling it? Instead of calling it the Big Fat Comedy Show, he was calling it Tons of Fun. So it's almost showtime. In fact, it's past showtime. And uh, we have two people, two people in the audience. Thursday night, sometimes this happens. You show up for the big show and no one else does. Gary Fields is here. He's going to make a determination on whether there's going to be a show or not. So we'll see. Be nice to have an audience. This is very, very rare. This, I don't think he's ever had to cancel a show before. I don't know if that says something about me as a draw. I'm in the mood to perform. Well, we can do it. That's oh, right. well, you meant on stage. On stage, yeah. I'm in, I'm in the cool. mood That's to do cool. a show on stage. I have performed for four people. Two couples sitting right up in the front of the, uh, right in front of the stage, and pretty much I just grabbed a chair and sat down and talked to them. Guess what, gals? No show tonight. We. Uh... First, well, it's actually the uh, second one in probably uh, 14 years we've canceled other than snow. So we don't know uh, what's it's going on. It's not snowing outside. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I forgot to announce the show was tonight. I have that memory. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. You get all geared up. You get all uh, excited to, to do a performance, and then you have to, you have to kind of get rid of that energy somehow. So maybe I should go run around the block. <laughs> That's not going to happen. The first time I ever performed stand-up was in college, University of Michigan, Kappa Talent Show, which was like a big deal. My dad, my sister, my brother, everybody, they were there. I came in second place, first runner-up. To get second was like success. Best friend was there, she was talking about being my manager, you know, we was like, yeah, we gonna blow up. And that weekend, that Monday, I got shot. I wasn't taking classes and I was up to school for the summer. I came home just to visit and uh, I got shot in the leg. It was a uh, it was a drive-by. My leg was shattered. I was in the hospital for a couple weeks. I was on crutches for like 10 months. Um, ended up with like Bell's palsy after that, which was a face paralysis and just a lot of other, it was a lot of recuperation time. And actually I used to wear sports gear and walk around campus like I was an athlete. <laughs> I was trying to do comedy at night and didn't take classes during the day. I told him that he should choose one. Uh, that way he can devote his full attention to it. It was just too much. I ended up having to withdraw from that semester. Even though I was doing really well, I just couldn't finish. It was just too much. And I remember thinking, and it was like, well, you know, are you going to do this comedy full time? Are you going to really pursue this? Yeah, I believe he had like two classes left to take. And he made that decision that he wanted to devote his full attention to comedy. If you know that you can go get a job making a decent wage, then sometime, 
you let money rule you instead of you um, looking for your passion or working or trying to achieve your passion. I started hosting some clubs in the city, started getting on the radio, a, a big comedy club moved here, I started traveling more. So I started having some levels of success getting my name out there. People were becoming aware of me somewhat. Back in the day, they were like, when I first started, there was like a $50 show, then it moved up to like 200 And last year, they were like $500 shows. It was like, okay, I'll do it for you for 500 I remember sometimes I think like 500 ain't Some people work all week for $500. Now it's like two grand for just a, okay, I'll do it. But I told him now he's gonna, he's gonna find new relatives <laughs> that, that he never knew before. Hey Horace, I'm your distant cousin, twice removed. And now it's time to see who won. Hit me with the digit stick. Oh, it's Horace, HP. Saunders, congratulations, sir. Horace, he has a lot of uh, very talented people supporting him now. Uh, you know, Sinbad's family apparently is behind him, and that means a lot because Sinbad's brother Mark is a, is, is a great mind in the world of comedy. Excuse me, can you come with me? See, 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 see my brother's trying to come out. See, they, they put on a different front, different world. Camera, it's a different world now, ain't it? Horace, as a stand up comic, he's very much like Sarah Lee. Like, nobody doesn't like him. You know, he's just a really likable humorist. I'd rather tap into the lighter side, the, uh, the joyous side, the part that makes everybody laugh, that can lift you up. Because you can laugh and, and it not be uplifting. You know, so there are many things that are true, but they're negative in the mud. You know, it's like, man, I don't want to keep hearing that. Being positive, thinking good, look at the bright side. If you don't like your job, enjoy the ride to work. <laughs> Get some CDs you like. <laughs> I'm gonna be late, I gotta hear the chorus. <laughs> If you don't like where you live at, act like you're visiting. <laughs> Keep your coat on. <laughs> and talk junk. I'll see y'all later. I'm about to go. This kid's going to go far. Uh, you can't beat the ability to write funny jokes and that natural thing he has of just being incredibly likable. Um, he's going to do fine. Because right now, you've got so many people in the business who are either extremely dirty or extremely unlikable, like myself. Um, there's a place for Horace. When I first started in college, I was like, at the talent show, a lot of people's parents came up. Now, if I met your parents, I wouldn't cuss at them. I, you know, how the hell are you doing? You know, it's a whole world out there that wants to laugh, that doesn't want to hear all that. So it's way more people you can reach. And my faith in God always complimented that. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> you know, even if you don't know many scriptures, you get in trouble, you'll start quoting them. Ooh, my shepherd is the Lord. Ooh, Lord, I need a German shepherd. <laughs> You say anything that sounds religious, Jesus wept, Holy Bible, Merry Christmas! I was hoping that the, our thing here would be way in the front end of the building as soon as you come in because then the people would see us right away. I would introduce cartoons, Clutch Cargo, Courageous Cat, uh, Dick Tracy, and the big one was The Three Stooges. I did their, the last movie in 1964. I played Billy the Kid in a thing called The Outlaws is Coming. So Mo called me and Mo said, Johnny Ginger, he said, I want to thank you very much for bringing us back. Curly and Curly Joe and Larry and I really appreciate it. I, I got to do, I think about seven uh, series, uh, national things, which were, I did Twilight Zone, Combat, and I got to meet a lot of wonderful people. Sammy was a very dear friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he got me on The Rifleman. He was working at the Elmwood Casino in Windsor, and I was doing a special, an adult version of the Johnny Ginger Show at night. And I called him and I said, Sam, would you be my guest? Oi, man, anytime you want me, tell me where and what time, and I'll be there. It's a gay bar. Lesbian walks in. She's down at the end of the bar. It's summertime. She's got a tank top on. Doesn't shave. Got hair in her eyes. She's trying to get the bartender's attention. <laughs> down here. Down here. Drunk at the end of the bar. She's bartender. Come here. Yes. He said, I would like to buy that ballerina a drink. <laughs> he said, why do you call her a ballerina? He said, anybody can lift their leg that high. It's got to be a ballerina. stuff I could never do on my television show. <laughs> the demise of the Johnny Ginger show was uh, not very ceremonial. It was terrible. 
I'm walking down the hallway towards the dressing room and I had to go past Pete Strand's office, the producer. And I walked by and he said, hey, great tan. I said, thanks. He said, by the way, the show is over. I said, what? 11 years? He said, well, you didn't think it was gonna last forever, did you? I was devastated. And I thought, you know, I've done all these series. I can get back into doing that and be famous, real famous. So I went back out there and they didn't want anything to do with me because of the fact that when I was doing it, I was boosting ratings in Detroit and now I was nobody. Then my mind shut down when I had the nervous breakdown. It was like my brain was saying, I just, I can't do this anymore. And I moved back to Ohio and then I started working in clubs again. Leave you guys with a joke. How's that sound? It's about time, fat ass, get funny. <laughs> you never know when you're gonna just eat it. And you, can, and you never know why. They're, they're not real friendly. They're not a friendly crowd. It's hard to face the reality of, yeah, maybe I just sucked that night. This is how you know if your material is bad. If that's what you're getting in the audience. There was maybe four people in the audience and the guy told me I should quit comedy, that I wasn't funny, that I was never going to be funny and he can't imagine whatever made me think I was funny and that he didn't want to pay me. And he paid me and I remember thinking, man, maybe I should just quit. I say if you never wanted to quit comedy, then you ain't really a comedian. I think that goes for any job, but for definitely for comedy, I can speak firsthand. There's many times I'm like, man, what am I doing? You know, you can't make it about yourself. You have to make it about the situation and about like how to fix it. There are some times that I have killed with the same material and knock people out of their chairs, do the same show at a different place, and it lays there. Comics are very hard on themselves, but every now and then we'll go, you know, that worked in, in every other town except this one. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe they just don't get it. You know, failure makes you smart, makes you strong, it makes you better. That's my daughter, and this is my ex-wife. With the second marriage, it was more of a financial thing. I had a brand new baby daughter that I wanted to be home with all the time and uh, didn't want to go on the road. Do you need my help? Uh, I think I got it. I just, I realized that I could do comedy part-time, not travel as much, add a day job to that, and live a, a essentially the same life. This is one of the reasons I, I wanted to get off the road was I had developed back problems and all that driving from gig to gig to gig was just making it impossible on my, on my back. So what do I do? I get a job that uh, I drive over a thousand miles a week. I had a particularly good show and at the end of the show the promoter came up to me and said if you would have been this funny back when you were hungry, you would have been a big star. The aspirations of me going out to Hollywood and being a movie star are pretty much out. I just like to be able to get to the point of my life where I don't have to screen every phone call because I'm afraid it's a bill collector. I gotta go, my time's up. You guys were fun, thank you all very much. Bye-bye everybody. I wish I would have done more, I guess, but I'm still proud of what I've done. Wednesday, last day of the year. And don't miss it coming up, we'll have comedian Mike Green. Honk, honk. <laughs> boy together, my ex-wife and I, like, um, who has kids by round of applause? I think Josh probably asked, yeah. Um, good. Um, if, if no kids, you guys? I won't pick on you, I promise. I'll point some stuff out to you, though, should you decide to have kids. This will be very helpful. There's a book called What to Expect When You're Expecting. It's a scary-ass book. The women know it. It's, uh, it's written by Stephen King in the, um... <laughs> I have joint physical and joint legal custody of my little boy. I have to be one in a million as far as stand-up comics. I can't imagine how anybody else could do it. I get up at, you know, 6.30 in the morning or whatever. I take my little boy to school. If it's a day where he has to go back to his mom's, I have to get him back to his mom's, and then I'd have to uh, get home, take a shower, and uh, 
go do a gig somewhere. In a case where I can't uh, be home for a week, some, some gigs are Monday through Saturday, she'll uh, take them for a week and then let me have them for the following week. And so she's real good about working that out. And that's important. What time tomorrow do I pick him up? Yeah, from you guys just gotta Latchkey. I, I have joint custody of him, but I bought her breast implants. Oh. And I don't, and I, I don't get to see them anymore. Like, I'm thinking, I'm going to sue her for visitation rights. Like, I don't know if that's possible. But I, I don't want him back. I just want to see him on the weekends. <laughs> like, oh, I miss you guys so much. <laughs> you Who's your call, daddy? Call social services. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's not treating him right. <laughs> I know she's got some guy touching him. Yeah. There's some guy over there God. touching him. I see a here. My job has always been the most important thing in my life, my goals in, my, in, in comedy, but uh, now he's the most important and, and this has to come second. Like that's the reason I haven't moved to LA or, or done any of the things that I'm supposed to do. It's because uh, you know I have more important things here. Nice face, give me a kiss and a hug. See you, buddy. I love you. And how many kids do you have? Uh, I have one, my girlfriend has one, and we uh, found out last week we have one on the way. Congratulations. Thanks, yeah. I'm hurting so bad. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm you. No, that was me. I beat him. I'm 38 years old. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be like 65 year old. My kid's gonna be like, Dad, can I borrow the car? Blink once for yes and twice for no. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't. I'm old. A week ago. I didn't do the dishes during the day. And then I heard about how uh, I don't do shit around the house. And then uh, how easy my job is. The perception of the people in my life who think that it's easy makes it difficult. We don't want to bring it with us. What's the point? We can't I'll play it in the car. in the car. We can't play it in the car. I won't. Very often people think I have the easiest job in the world and that is so far from the truth. I mean, I travel 36 weeks a year. Any time that I'm away from home feels like work. If I'm on the road for seven days and I'm only doing, like say I'm only doing seven shows, I'm still away from home. I'm not doing what I want to be doing. Like, I don't know if you know anybody from Michigan. We always do this stupid thing where we say our hand is shaped like our map, which is dumb, I guess. Like, um, like people from Italy don't go, I live right here, <laughs> you know, they're not. And, uh, <laughs> That'd be fun. Some old guy in Florida, come here, I'll show you the keys. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God, Grandpa's got his map out again. You're like, <laughs> and that is the fun part. That's what keeps me doing it, is the hour on stage. If it wasn't for the, if you didn't have that, man, I can't imagine what would keep me doing it. Thanks very much. Have a happy new year. I got a phone call from um, a guy at Comedy Central in Los Angeles and he said, oh, we want you to be on Premium Blend. And I just, I thought it was a joke at first, but I was pretty excited about it. I've already taken Chris Newberg out to Los Angeles, had him on stage out there, had a pitch meeting with MTV. So I'm able to use those connections that I've developed over the years to open some doors. It's just a copy of the contract for Premium Blend 7. And it was sent to Mark and it's got my name and it's got all the stipulations and all the information on the inside. And it says that they pay me $1,246 for seven minutes, which is cool. For someone who just started doing stand-up not quite two years ago, that's a pretty good fast progression. And you know, I couldn't be happier, because I think if something good happens for him, I know that him and I are good enough friends to where he would do whatever he could to help it, it advance my career. Or I mean, it's, it's silly to be competitive. You know, and so many comedians, I'm certain, are like, well, why did he get it, and how come I didn't get it? You got so many people trying to funnel themselves into this little bitty hole to make it, so it's a lot of competitiveness. I think that there are people that say, Chris has gotten too far too fast. If he didn't have this in, or if he didn't have that, or if he didn't have a guitar, and that's not true. And I think you just have to ignore those people, because those aren't the people. They should be working on their own stuff. Recently, I played a show with a comedian, and, um, and she was like, he, oh, I don't have a guitar, and bet that guy wouldn't be funny if uh, 
he didn't have a guitar. I let him get up here without his guitar and tell jokes. And like, you know, that's not going to make you suck any less, you know, just because that's what you're saying. So I think Jay Chris is a very confident person. And I think that he doesn't like to hear all that crap because he is businesslike. I'm sure there's lots of people out there that we've never heard of that are really funny, but they don't show up for their gig on time. Or they say do 45 minutes worth of material and they do an hour. Or they say, when you do this corporate gig, don't swear. And the comic does. And I think that's the best way to be in this business. Sometimes that can be taken as that guy's cocky or whatnot. You have to have an ego to be up there on a stage and showing off you're saying look at me watch me be funny watch me do this and that I want to be like I want to I want to be to the point where like when you think about Michigan comedy it's like you know Tim Allen J Chris Newberg you know it mentioned in the same sentence I want it all I want to do the, the most I can possibly do with it I'm really relaxed so I'm not worried about my set whether he wins or not I tell him that he I, I think that he's did real well, and I'm happy for him, I'm proud of him. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Appreciate the fact that you even gave me this opportunity. Appreciate so many people pulling for me, and people calling me, and even now I can't even answer the phone. Just thank you, Lord. I want to always say thank you. You say whether we have much or have nothing, we got to learn to be thankful. And they got me with that plan. You know, 3,000 minutes for 39.99, but that's 400 anytime minutes, 2,600 nights and weekends. You know what I'm saying? I went to middle school. That's 400 divided by 30. <laughs> That's 8.7 minutes a day. Who are you gonna talk to for 8.7 minutes a day? For 8.7 minutes a day before nine o'clock, this is no longer a cell phone. This is caller ID. Call you after nine, call you after nine, call you after nine. Unavailable, you better call me after nine. Five stars. Oh! Five stars. Five stars. My, Naomi Chan. Have you heard the one about the comedian that had a Grand Slam five-star dunk? Oh! Got a perfect score. I have been waiting on that and, and, and praying for that and working towards that, develop, getting better each time. One of these gentlemen is about to win $100,000 in a CBS development deal. Hit me! Oh! With 39 stars, the winner is Horace H.B. Sanders, Detroit, Hollaback. And I won, so that was sweet. So I'm the grand champion. I get $100,000, uh, cash prize. Then you get a appearance on a CBS show, something that's already out, and you get a development deal for your own show. And I'm like, that's what I really want. That's the thing. The cash is cool. Don't get me wrong. I needed the money. But the development deal, you could end up making 100000 an episode with the right kind of show. Things you can buy jokes with that kind of money. You don't, you don't have to steal them no more. You know what I'm saying? You can just buy a joke. Great. Thank you. How old are you, may I ask? 31. Very young. You have a huge, huge, huge amount of time to shine. Thank you, sir. Really, you are great. You are really great, sir. You know, like Spider-Man, I got great powers, great responsibility. I always wanted to be a superhero. I got a superpower. I mean, think about it. Everybody wants to be funny. You go to church, preachers want to be funny. The president wants to be funny. People want to learn how to keep people's attention. And we have this power, this comedy. So you got to take all that energy, take it together, and then you're going to make all these different people laugh together, show them a commonality within themselves. That's amazing. It used to say uh, the remission tour because I was in my second remission and it came back, so the cancer sucks tour. But I don't sell those anymore. I'm in remission again, third remission, so. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the same time I was starting my comedy career or starting to do it professionally. I do know that when I was first diagnosed and couldn't work much, a comic by the name of Steve Ayat got together with uh, Gary Fields and some other comics, they threw this big uh, benefit for me. We don't have 401k plans. We don't have health insurance a lot of times. I don't have health insurance. Um, my little boy does, but I can't afford to, uh, to pay for my own insurance. It was just an incredible thing. I'd, I'd never had anyone do something like that for me before. It's really cool feeling all that support from uh, fellow comics, especially for me being so new to the business. But I never talked about it on stage until a friend encouraged me to. He said, Chrissy, you talk about everything else that's going on in your life. You should, uh, you should deal with the, the cancer issue the same way. My favorite nurse in the hospital was the ICU nurse. Now, I wasn't in intensive care, but she kept poking her head in my room going, I see you. And um, 
now I know that's silly, but it was silliness that saved me in the hospital, I'll tell you that. I met with my doctors and they said no. It's taking its toll, all the traveling, all the uh, not being around a hospital to get the treatment I needed and that type of thing. And that scared me worse than dying, that uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do. So I told them no. One day they wanted to do a spinal tap on me. I didn't want a spinal tap. Doctor came around, he says, uh, I understand you're giving us trouble about this spinal tap. I said, you know what, Doc? I will blow you if I don't have to have a spinal tap. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> I think you heard me, Doc. <laughs> he had these two interns with him, so he has to turn it into like a teaching situation. He says, uh, well, obviously we have a patient here who's handling her fear with humor. How would you deal with the situation? And the one intern goes, I don't know, given the offer on the table, I think the procedure could wait a couple days. <laughs> we scheduled chemotherapy all across the United States, and I would perform and take chemo at the same time. My, my doctor in charge of everything said that uh, he couldn't explain why I was able to do what I did, why I was able to take the intensive treatment and still go out and perform and drive. Honest to God, when they first said, Chrissy, you have to have chemo, this was my first thought. Well, bite me, Jenny Craig. <laughs> this will be the ultimate diet plan. Turns out I was on a drug called prednisone. It's a steroid, so that explains the hair on my chest. Um, and my dick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> When I was uh, very, very, very sick, I had been on chemotherapy, and there came a show when I didn't think I could do it. I was too sick. And then I heard my introduction, and I walked out, and the minute my foot hit that stage, I started to feel better. And then when I got that first laugh, it was gone. The pain was gone, the, 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 the feeling of being sick was gone, and for 45 minutes, I was pain-free, I was in my own space where everything was okay, and it was, it was an incredible, incredible rush. Laughter has been one of the most effective weapons in my cancer battle. I don't know what your battles are, but if I can use laughter, so can you. I believe that laughter and performing and the adrenaline or the spiritual high or whatever it was, I think that was a big factor in my remissions. I, I think I, I going to keep doing comedy for a long time. Oh, it's nice to be here. My first time at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, and uh, I've been back in Detroit now for uh, two years. I was gone for a long time, and so good to be back again. I'm going to have to ad-lib. I can't find a prop. We're going to start the show in a very short time, folks. The kids that I entertained when they were like 10 years old, 11 years old, they're like 45 years old now. And these are my nightclub people. It, it never ceases to amaze me when I'm working a club. Nine out of ten people will come up. I'm a fan. I used to wah ba ba. Do you remember the time you had your horse on the show? And they recall all these things. They remember it. And it's a real kick for me to know that I made that much of an impression that these people remember those particular bits. Hey! Thank you. What? Hey, chair. What? Are, are you in good shape, pal? Well, before I came here tonight, I was standing in front of the full-length mirror at the house, and I told Terry I got the body of a 35-year-old man. Well, you better get it back to him, because you're getting it all wrinkled. <laughs> My kids, a lot of times, will say, Dad, are you going to retire? I say, for what? From what? I hold a microphone. I don't lift anything heavy. I'm having too much fun and I'm just, you know, in my stride right now. It took me all these years to get where I am, so I ain't about to quit. I am 70 years old. And it's terrible. God damn. My age, uh, I have, uh, there's a funny thing about that. I just don't like getting older. You know you're getting old when your insurance company sends you a half a calendar. <laughs> Damn. I'm not 20 years old anymore. I figure, you know, how many years have I got to go and how many, how many more audiences can I uh, entertain and how many more people can I make happy? I thank you for making this very enjoyable for me tonight. I hope to come back here because you are a wonderful crowd. I'm on my way back home. God bless you all, Mom, Dad, and Patty. Good night. Thank you so much. I have uh, worked the stage. I have been on radio, television, movies. 
and there's still a lot of stuff to do. And I'll do it and, you know, until I can't do it anymore. Ah. I'm not through yet. I joked about waking up hungover, Carl, and I quit drinking. I, uh, I quit. I quit because, um, well, because I got caught. I, I woke up naked, chained to a dead goat. And, um, no, that's, that's not, I was bad. No, that, that's not true. Um, you have, if you're working an hour a night, you have 23 hours of free time to do absolutely nothing with but to fill, you know? I mean, I'd drink every night and wake up hungover every day and then try to fix the hangover and, you know, and then do it all over again the next night. I started drinking young and I got caught drinking and driving and there's a new law in Michigan if you get caught drinking and driving a second time they could keep your car they get to take your car so I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a hundred dollar drinking car <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do and then they pull me over oh you got me <laughs> here's the keys <laughs> good luck with the old girl she's not what she used to be <laughs> I got like vice grip for a steering wheel and a rag hanging out the back <laughs> that's my gas cap <laughs> Careful, it's also a wick. <laughs> anyway. We need to find an angle, I think, that um, you know, maybe something that nobody else is doing uh, for next year. Well, have you worked on something, I mean, other than, you know, just your act, or? I'd like to maybe do something recovery-based, or if I could talk to kids, or, you know. Well, like from the angle, let's see, I mean, you know, you're talking about incorporating it in your stand-up or like being a keynote speaker or I mean what's your angle? I mean what would you say? I heard the sound where you can hear the lights saying what color they are. That's how drunk I was. It goes when you get pulled over it goes blue <laughs> like that. <laughs> you have to drive an extra block to make sure it's for you. <laughs> you ever do that? One? Please pass me, put my seatbelt on. Who's been caught drinking and driving? <laughs> have you? What were the tests they gave you? What they have you do? The alphabet, yeah, that's called the alphabet. <laughs> you ever heard of this? They made my friend say the alphabet backwards. You ever heard of that? Yeah. yeah, that's not fair. Like I asked a cop one time, I go, how could you do that? He goes, because nine out of ten times, people go, I can't do that when I'm sober. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you got me, that was a good one. I would get so drunk that I'd get together with my friends and we'd have big parties. I'd I'd practice. Practice. Throughout the night. Okay, I was man, drunk, I got out of the car, I was like ZYX, WVU, TSRQ, BONMLKJ, HGF, EDCBA. Oh my god! That was sweet, man. Dude, you could make, you're the Tony Robbins of drinking and That's driving. Right. I, uh, I got pulled over, it was a lady cop who pulled me over and I rolled down the window in a, uh, is on that side. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> when I'm drunk, I drive on the passenger side. <laughs> That would be funny as shit. If you're drunk, you're on the wrong side one night, they walk up, you're like, what? <laughs> Fuck, where'd he go? <laughs> Dude, I don't think he was wearing his seatbelt either. <laughs> you better get him, this is bullshit. He does this every time that I am too drunk to drive. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, he left his pot here too. <laughs> I've got Mike hooked up with the college agent now. Is very, very confident that he's going to do a lot of things for him. I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, branch out and and figure out what it is that separates me from the comedians who make it. It's easy to get jaded or fall into your little circle. Like I'm content just doing this. Like no, it's so much more out there still. There was a, um, a comedian several years ago who worked my club on a regular basis and was making, you know, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a week on average. And he had some problems that he had to overcome, and he became a motivational speaker, but in a funny way. And that income turned out to be seventy-five hundred dollars a night. I guess most most importantly, this. Uh, this little speech, little lecture, is going to be about um, alcohol awareness, and and not to be. I don't want to be preachy because I think that sucks. When I when I started drinking, I guess I was uh, 13 years old, and I, I had my, my first drinks and uh, with a buddy of mine at lunchtime in uh, in in seventh grade. We uh, we had I weighed like 42 pounds, literally. I weigh 130 now, so figure half of that. I. Um, I drank like seven shots of tequila because I thought that was the right amount at 13. And, uh, 
And I'm, I'm not going to tell you I slept in a dumpster and I'm not going to tell you all that stuff because that didn't happen. I, I maintained a very uh, successful career as far as stand-up comedy. And, um, but on the side, I had a very serious um, drinking problem. I did the show, I got really drunk, and I blacked out. When I woke up, I was, um, I was in jail. And I had no idea why I was in jail. I genuinely had no idea, I had no recollection whatsoever. And then the um, detectives came in and reminded me what I had done. They, they said that I had robbed somebody with a knife the night before. And that was so, I can't even explain to you how out of character that was for me. I, I am not that kind of person and I, I have never done anything like that in my life. But I made bad decisions because I was drunk. And I did 90 days, which was a miracle. I mean, um, the, the sentence was 10 years. I did 90 days, um, well, because of the exchange rate, I think, because it was in Canada. And, um, <laughs> no, it really was in Canada. They were like, did you rob him, eh? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I guess I did. And both of my parents were in a recovery program. They were, uh, they were both in AA, and so they suggested that I go. And I started going. You know, I don't, wanna, I don't want you guys to look at me and think, holy cow, what a freak, because I'm not. All right? I hope that wasn't too preachy. Thanks, you guys. Your first, your first time out of the blocks, you know, I mean, I'd say you got a, like a B, B minus on a, you know, you're, look, you're looking at a grade, so you're not doing too bad. You know, the other thing to consider is if you're, if you want to do questions and answers. The other thing to consider is if you want to invite students afterwards to chat with you. There are some stand-ups that do, that will double book themselves. They'll lecture during the day and then sell themselves as a stand-up at night. So, I mean, that's something that I could look towards doing, too. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to being a father again. It's, it's exciting, and, you know, I, I think that a lot of comedians probably have the perception that in order to be a successful comic, you have to be single on the road, screwing waitresses, and I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm not. I, uh, I did that. <laughs> I've had a pretty sketchy life, you know, with three ex-wives and now two children from two different wives or a wife and a girlfriend. I mean, I'm not even married. And I know that people are like, Jesus Christ, what a weird life. But I remember I was 20 and um, a pretty well-known comedian at the time told me you have to live life before you can write funny jokes. And I am doing that. You are something. You have something on your nose. But I have to actually uh, be in New Jersey Monday, and uh, it's Friday, so I'm gonna um, get on a plane Monday morning and go to New Jersey, and I'm doing an alcohol awareness lecture. I, I have no complaints about it. It's, it's what I chose to do in my life, and, and stand-up, unfortunately, at this point, has to come second. It's my career, and uh, if, if I have good fortune and uh, you know luck prevails, then uh, maybe something good will happen. But I, I love my life. I genuinely love being a father, and I love um, the life I, I feel I've, I've made for myself.
I'm not talking about the ordinary winter days, but those select 10 or 12 that we have every year. The ones when you're walking with your friend and there's a stinging wind and the snow is smacking you and you're outside and you don't want to be and you're like, uh, fucking fuck, fuck, you know those? And you say to your buddy, you're like, God, dude, how cold do you think this is? He would go, this is bullshit. <laughs> that could be a temperature here. Like uh, today, partly bullshit. After the high pressure comes down, it's gonna fuck everything up. I'm a romantic, it's true. You know, and every time I'm about to have sex, I ask myself the same question. How is this gonna appear on my credit card? How long y'all been dating? Six months. Six months, I knew it was new. Cause they is looking at each other. Look at it, he got his arm around, he can't even drink his drink. He right handed, he drinks with the left. Dribble, dribble for my baby. Dribble, dribble. <laughs> Give me about six years. Would you move? You know I can't drink with that arm. Two drunks in a boat fishing Houghton Lake. Bottle floats by. One drunk picks it up, pulls the cork, and a big genie appears. He says, I am the genie of the lamp. I request that you give me one wish, and I will grant your wish. One drunk says, hey, swear, why don't you turn a lake into beer? So shall it be, and he disappeared. The other drunk said, you dumb son of a bitch. He said, what? He said, now we gotta piss in a boat. <laughs> Please, keep supporting live comedy here at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle and keep laughing. Thank you very much.